Aloha, everyone. Thank you so much for joining our second quarter Mojo event. We have a very exciting topic to talk about today, and that is actually the historic tug of the battleship Missouri to Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. This would be her last voyage at sea to her permanent resting home here in Hawaii. Just a few housekeeping rules for our guest. If everyone could please remember to mute yourself until the Q&A portion at the end. We will be taking questions through the chat box feature throughout the program. So if you have questions as they come up, please put them into the chat room and we will address them all at the end of the presentation. Um, for best viewing purposes, put your uh, viewing capabilities into speaker view until the Q&A session that'll allow you to see the presentation in its full screen. And lastly, we're gonna sit back, grab a cup of coffee or drink of your choice and enjoy the presentation. First, I wanted to introduce our president and CEO, Mike Carr. He is going to introduce our speakers and then we will take it over from there. Thank you, Jacqueline, and welcome. Good afternoon, everybody, uh, or good evening, wherever you may be. Uh, it's great to have you all here. Uh, this uh, yesterday was the 25th anniversary of the ship arriving uh, in Hawaiian waters. And today is the 25th anniversary of the ship being pulled into Pearl Harbor. So I know uh, we're going to hear a lot about that. I want to introduce Roy Yi. Uh, Roy, can you wave down there? Roy is the first president of the USS Missouri Memorial Association and one of my predecessors. And I also want to introduce Corey Ogard, who is the former captain of the Sea Victory, who towed the ship here. And as you'll probably learn, towed lots of other ships to their final resting places as well. I get to sit back and just enjoy along with all of you. And I'm going to turn it over to a moderator today, who is the curator of our association, Mr. Frank Clay. Frank? Thank you, Mike. Aloha, everyone, and welcome to Mojo today. Uh, very exciting for us and for me as well. Um, I'm the curator of the Battleship Missouri, and I'll be facilitating this discussion with uh, Roy and Corey, and you're going to hear some pretty cool stuff uh, about this uh, anniversary and getting the mighty motor Pearl Harbor. Um, but before we get started, I just would like to have uh, Roy and Corey uh, introduce themselves. So Roy, if you don't mind starting, if you could just introduce yourself briefly and uh, your background, please. Uh, yes, uh, I uh, started out as an electrical engineer <laughs> and uh, worked in the family business and then uh, went on uh, to become president of a private shipyard here in Honolulu. And through that, I went on to work for Hawaiian Electric Industries and somehow got involved with the shipyard business by running a, a, a private shipyard here that was looking for more work after the Vietnam War. So we got involved with the uh, home porting efforts uh, originally to bring the battleship Missouri here after coming out of mothballs from Bremerton. Uh, that did not happen. Um, but at the end of the Gulf War, uh, she was slated to go back into uh, 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 mothballs in Bremerton, but a group of uh, leaders in, in Hawaii decided that maybe we ought to bring her out here to Hawaii and, and be a museum ship. And that started this whole process of uh, the donation and uh, you'll hear more about it uh, through this next hour or so. That's a real quick update there. Uh, Frank. Well, thank you, Roy. And uh, Corey, if you don't mind, uh, just if you could briefly introduce yourself and uh, your background. Yes, good afternoon. Uh, obviously, I'm a retired towboat captain. I started on tugboats 1970 and retired at the end of 2005, so I had 35 years of it. Uh, owed a lot in Alaska, almost every dog hole there is in Alaska, being Seattle Company, uh, that was a main part of our, our business. Uh, and I've kind of towed worldwide uh, after that. I towed three of these uh, battleships, I towed aircraft carriers, heavy cruisers, and the ships go all the way down to frigates, and I even towed the last uh, submarine that was built with diesel engines uh, from Long Beach to Bremerton, where I think it became razor blades there. Uh, so it's been an interesting life, uh, but the Missouri tow, I think, tops them all as, as far as uh, the impact it's had on me. So. Well, and thank you, Corey. Um, 
So before we get into kind of discussion about the toe of the Missouri, I really want to go over the timeline of how we get to this point uh, briefly for folks who might not know. Um, so on March 31st, 1992, uh, the USS Missouri was decommissioned from active service uh, by the US Navy. And obviously a ship of this historical significance was destined to become a museum ship. Um, so by 1995, the US Navy started soliciting proposals from cities uh, to put in bids to host the Missouri as a museum ship. And four cities submitted proposals, uh, Pearl Harbor, uh, Bremerton, Washington, uh, and then San Francisco and Long Beach, California, all put in bids. Uh, and on August 21st, 1996, uh, Secretary of the Navy John Dalton uh, announced uh, that the Navy was going to award the, the USS Missouri to the USS Missouri Memorial Association and that the ship would be going to Pearl Harbor. Now, this was decision, this decision was not without controversy. Um, and in fact, uh, there were many challenges, uh, mainly from the Bremerton interests. Um, their congressional delegation uh, put in challenges. Uh, to either reopen the bidding process or uh, to, uh, at the very least, kind of delay the, the ship being moved to Pearl Harbor. Um, and the, all these legal, there are also some lawsuits filed by private entities as well, again, with the same effort of either trying to reopen the bidding process or uh, stopping or delaying the tow. Uh, but the, none of the legal challenges failed. Uh, they, none of them were successful. They all uh, failed. And on May 4th, 1998, Secnav Dalton uh, signed the documents that officially handed custody of the USS Missouri to our association. Now, simultaneously in Honolulu, Roy signed a receipt uh, officially accepting custody of the Battleship Missouri. Uh, and we'll hear from Roy a little bit about that in just a second. And then simultaneously uh, in Bremerton, uh, a contingent of Missouri Association staff actually got the keys and physical custody of the ship over in Bremerton. Um, so very interesting uh, timeline that we got to. And um, first off, I wanna ask Roy, um, what kind of work went into the effort to get the Missouri here prior to this May 4th signing? And also I wanna ask you, how, does it, how did it feel uh, to sign a receipt for an Iowa-class battleship? <laughs> well, well, first of all, the official donation documents were signed by Ed Carter, the chairman of the board. And I got a call from Pete Galassi up there in the inactive ship fleet in Bremerton and saying, I need you to sign uh, a piece of paper that you got the ship. And so I said, all right, send it over to me and, and I'll take a look at it. Well, this was a hand receipt that they use uh, normally when you want to pick up a box of uh, uh, of tools or something like that. <laughs> and I, I looked at Don Hess and Vicky and I said, I guess I could just sign this because the official documents uh, uh, was already signed off. So this is just a hand receipt. So I signed it, sent it back to Pete, and I called Don Hess, who was on the, sh on the ship in Bremerton already. And I says, Don, uh, I officially signed over uh, for the, the ship and make sure that we take care of all security because it's ours now. And he says, yes, I know. I see Pete running down the pier right now to hand me the keys. So <laughs> That's really how this document was signed. Um, but, you know, uh, going back to your, your original question, uh, Frank, uh, this getting to Missouri here was an economic development project put on to get more ships to Hawaii for ship repair. Uh, but that failed. And, and so, you know, due to the efforts of... Uh, uh, Admiral Hayes, uh, Admiral Alvy Wright, uh, and uh, uh, Admiral Tom Hayward, they asked uh, to have the ship uh, donated uh, to Hawaii and, and not take her back to Bremerton. Well, that didn't work. Uh, so the uh, Secretary of Navy then put uh, the ship out for bid, as you had reported a little bit earlier. 
And uh, so a proposal was put together to uh, get the ship donated. And that was a very long, arduous process uh, in trying to figure out financing, location, uh, engineering. Um, and so that's, that's really the work that went on behind it. And then after uh, Se uh, Secretary Dalton awarded it to us, that started a legal battle, as you also reported. Um, and, 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 and so let's leave it to that, and then you can go on and talk more about the tug. Right. So um, when the ship, uh, basically, to get the ship to Pearl Harbor, it was, uh, is, it, yeah, is it true that the Navy was not going to provide any financial or logistical support for the towing effort? That's correct, because uh, the the Missouri Memorial Association was a private entity, so they could not uh, do a tow of opportunity, as they called it back in those days, uh, with a, a, a Navy towboat. Uh, and, and so that was out, and it became then a very private affair. <laughs> we had to pay for the tugboat and, and the tow and pay rent at the pier at the same time. Okay. So the effort, so basically a lot of research was done to um, do the footwork, insurance, everything else, and also bid for the company that would do the tow. And uh, uh, if you could talk about the, the bidding process for the tow company and also why did you select uh, Crowley to do the job? Well, it, it, we, we, um, um, needed a, a, a towboat with huge horsepower. Uh, we had other towboat companies uh, uh, make a proposal to us with using two tugboats, but that is, you know, in an ocean tow of, of a vessel this large, having two towboats trying to coordinate the tow is, um, well, done, but, uh, not the best of all worlds. So we picked Crowley because they had a towboat, the Sea Victory, uh, with, uh, if I'm not correct, uh, my memory is 7,500 horsepower. And I rode that tugboat out and it was like sitting on top of, of a locomotive engine. And uh, that's exactly what it was. Okay. Um, so I guess my next question is for uh, for Corey. So Corey, um... How did it feel to get the assignment uh, to be selected, you and the Sea Victory, uh, to have the be the tow boat for the USS Missouri? Oh, it was it was great. It was like hitting a home run. <laughs> uh, yeah, being a really good friend of my Marine Operations Manager, we sure kicked it around a lot, and uh, they even uh, well, he told me that they even put in the proposal that all the crew, the entire crew from top to bottom would be veterans. So that, it was great working on this, uh, going over to the ship, looking at the tow gear and uh, the energy just kept building and building all the time uh, until we actually did the job. And then uh, this wasn't your first involvement with USS Missouri, there's a photo up there of uh of uh, you being aboard the ship in Bremerton. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Well, that uh, you're talking about the picture with my son. Uh, he was about 10, 10 years, maybe not even 10 years old. Uh, and the reason why we're standing on the foredeck, the forecastle of the, the ship is I was over there because we were gonna tow another ship out. And I believe that ship would have been the Chicago uh, the heavy cruise of Chicago was being towed out to California to the junkyard. Uh, and, and you can see it still had the uh, mothball uh, dehumidification equipment all over the ship back then. Uh, but yeah, I had another picture that uh, my son was sitting on the rifle right behind my left ear there. Uh, it was low to the deck, so I could just throw him up on the rifle and it took his picture. But apparently through the years, he's taken it and he probably pinned it up on his bedroom somewhere. So I couldn't find it to send it to you. So Corey, if, um, if you could talk a little bit about the Sea Victory um, and 
you know, Roy kind of alluded to, you know, we, we needed a big, strong tugboat to do this. Could you tell us a little about the Sea Victory and her technical stats and um, what she was like to handle? Sure. Well, uh, Roy, the engines, the two engines were 3,600 horsepower apiece. So <laughs> mathematics, I guess, is 7,200 horsepower. But uh, there's like three different kinds of horsepower that they brag about and that uh, the actual horsepower that's come out of the propeller and then the static static horsepower or the engine just sitting there they they would have claimed 9000 horsepower but uh, you wouldn't see that for except for maybe 30 seconds when they tested it but it was uh 7200 but what what helped the the boat was we had court nozzles uh fixed court nozzles you can get steering court nozzles or or fixed fixed nozzles and that's what we had the fixed nozzles so it had a, it had a pretty good thrust uh my memory is correct i think we had a, a bollard pole we tested bollard pole of like 112 or 13 tons that's where we hook our tow line into a dead man on the beach somewhere and then we just pour the coal to her and see what the load cell will read uh and that's required a lot of times by uh insurance uh, uh people that when they a certain type of toll that's valued a lot of money they want a lot of horsepower so sometimes you have to use two tugs to reach that if it's a big enough object you're towing uh we towed one one object from uh, Prudhoe bay alaska to russia and it took three three tugs to do that one to get the correct ball and pull uh yeah it uh it was a really good sea boat i mean it just uh really comfortable in heavy weather really uh very good stability on it and very roomy uh, very comfortable the galley area where the crew would eat and hang out uh, it was spacious uh, it was a very very comfortable boat so to be a, a captain on a tugboat you really wanted to cover a job like that so i first went on that that boat in 1995 uh on that class of boat and i and it was that boat for a, a job we did towing ammunition around the far east and uh i just fell in love with it i so i spent the better part of 10 years on that boat okay and you'd mentioned that the eight of your crew that would do the tow for the missouri were all hand selected because they were veterans yeah that was one of the stipulations that, that they had to be a, a veteran I, i'm a navy veteran i was a crewman on a submarine in fact, my submarine, the USS Croker, is a museum itself now in, in Buffalo, New York. Uh, and my chief engineer, uh, he was a retired Army uh, uh, Army uh, enlisted man. He wasn't an officer, but but he was in engineering. I think he was in the Corps of Engineers or something like that. And the cook, uh, in fact, the cook is interesting. His name was, Roy knows the cook. His name was C.J. Good, the initial C.J. I, nobody ever knew his real name, if he even had one. But C.J. was our cook. And he at one time had cooked for Captain uh, Lee Case, K-A-I-S-S, -S, who was a captain on the Missouri. C.J. didn't sail on the Missouri. I think Captain Case must have, must have been on another vessel when, when C.J. did that. Yeah, and the my deckhands one was a vietnam veteran a marine uh my second mate my chief mate was a retired navy chief who was a navy pilot a ship a harbor pilot in the navy uh, steve cook uh, his name and uh, i don't remember all the crew's names without access to my logbook and the company has that uh, my second mate he uh to make sure we had uh veteran status was a recent graduate of a maritime academy and he had been commissioned a uh, commissioned officer in the navy out of school so he covered the bill there as far as being uh, veteran status and then um so for the missouri the missouri would have no crew and would not be functioning at all for the tow correct say that again frank so on the so for the Missouri itself, there would be no crew on board. The only crew oh. on the would be on the tugboat, correct? Uh, absolutely not. Once not when we're underway, absolutely okay. not. Uh, insurance underwriters, uh, and I assume they had insurance or, or something, wouldn't allow that. 
Okay. Um, but actually, this would be, you actually had recently towed to Hawaii uh, prior to this, and something very interesting, too, that you, you had towed the major pieces of the Ford Island Bridge uh, just before this project. Is that correct? Absolutely. Yeah, we, uh, we made uh, three trips. Two of them were tandem tows, two barges, and uh, one trip that had the the main feature, uh, the floating part that would slide open to allow ships to pass through the bridge was the, the fifth and final tow. And it's interesting because the, the Fort Island Bridge was kind of one of the linchpins for being able to have Missouri moored at on Fort Island, uh, because that bridge would give access, uh, visitor access, and access for, you know, staff and everyone else much easier than the uh, old um, the ferries that used to run uh, before. So, how did the tow uh, Fort Island bridge tow uh, go? Oh, that was good. A good job. Anytime you get a tow to Hawaii, you're up for it. <laughs> Nobody <laughs> turns it down. All right, so for the tow itself, uh, it was it was scheduled to be in two legs. Uh, the first, uh, obviously starting in Bremerton, the first leg uh, going to Astoria um, and then staying in Astoria for a little while and then from Astoria to Pearl Harbor. Uh, so Roy, uh, could you please uh, explain to us why the stop in Astoria was scheduled? Sure. Uh, the Alien Species Act was winding its way to full approval and we were given a heads up by the Coast Guard that we would be subjected to scrutiny uh, because of the Alien Species Act. So we took affirmative action before uh, any of this really took shape and we took samples of the uh, uh, growth on, on the Missouri bottom and had it compared to the, uh, the uh, what's in the water in, in Pearl Harbor. And yes, we were carrying alien species on her bottom. But being a, an, an old uh, shipyard guy, uh, they, they all know that if you change the water temperature and the, and the salinity, uh, you could kill off whatever growth was there uh, at the time. So. Don Hess and I went down to, uh, uh, you know, well, if we asked the Navy, first of all, what would be their, their choice uh, to have her uh, in a freshwater or a, a different type of waterway? Uh, because we could not get in on anybody's dry dock schedule for a vessel this large, and it would have cost us probably over a million dollars, million and a half, I think is the quote that I, I, I remember. And so uh, they said, well, okay, uh, you could uh, go to San Francisco. And I says, well, we just beat San Francisco for the award of the ship. Says, well, you could go to Long Beach. And I says, same thing. Uh, we just beat them uh, for the award of the ship. And then uh, they says, well, uh, you, you could go uh, uh, up into to Canada. And I says, no, I don't want uh, an international incident. And he, then they said, well, okay, Panama Canal, too far. And Alaska, too cold. So the last choice was to go um, uh, up the Columbia River. So Don Hess and I investigated uh, the, the uh, water flow and the, and the uh, salinity of, of, of the water in the Columbia River. And it turns out that Oregon State University, uh, where I went, um, had the whole mouth of the river um, instrumented. So we had exact salinity and flow rates. And it turns out that it was probably better for us to delay the tow from uh, April, which was the original scheduled date, to uh, May. Uh, and uh, sure enough, uh, when we uh, got into uh, Astoria and stayed there a week, the bottom literally turned white. Uh, so the the, uh, the the decision to move her to Astoria was correct and, uh, and avoided a, uh, an alien species into Pearl Harbor. Okay, and um, so obviously a lot of prep work had to go into a lot of infrastructure, a lot of planning, a lot of personnel had to be um, you know, used to kind of plan for this before, you know, the Sea Victor even hooks up to the Missouri. 
Um, could you explain to us a lot of the footwork that was done and planning and prep that was done for the tow? Oh, sure. I, I, I mean, down to cutting of the, the new dock lines that we would need in Hawaii, uh, that was uh, uh, done up in Bremerton uh, because we, we had a docking plan. But uh, we also needed to use some of the lines that were pre-cut uh, to go uh, uh, to be used in Astoria. So we shipped those dock lines in, into Astoria and uh, Matson uh, uh, so kindly uh, <laughs> shipped those dock lines back to, uh, to us in Pearl Harbor to beat the ship back. So that, the dock lines were one of the things that we had to prepare for. The other things were like, uh, uh, you know, getting the flooding alarms all set up correctly for the tow uh, and, and making sure everything was sealed up properly. Uh, and, and, and then to fend off a last minute uh, lawsuit <laughs> coming from out of the, I, I can't remember where it was, but someone had filed a lawsuit in, in Seattle, and, but we, we, we prevailed. So it wasn't that easy to get it out. Right. Um, and could you talk a little bit about your Magnificent Seven? Uh, the core staff you had, the very limited staff you had to work with to accomplish all of this? Oh, I, I had a wonderful staff of seven and, I, and I, I gave them the nickname of the Magnificent Seven because I said, your job is to bring the ship to Hawaii safely. And my job is to make sure that you have what you need to do that job. And so I told a newspaper reporter that I have coined the term the Magnificent Seven for uh, whoever was on the team at that time. All right, so um, so everything's ready to go. Uh, sea Victory's in place, personnel's in place, every, uh, the itinerary's in place. Um, so Corey, could you tell us about hooking up to the Missouri in Bremerton and uh, pulling her out uh, for the first time? Yeah, we, we didn't have too much to do uh, until the ship was pulled out of its berth by the Oh, I don't know how many assist boats we had there, four to six, you know. Uh, anyway, we just laid outside off until they pulled it out. And then we backed up to it, kind of like what you see in the picture here, and started hooking up. Um, and once again, there was a anybody that had a boat or any object that floated in the water was out there laying in wait. Uh, I don't know if I sent a, a picture to Jacqueline that showed as we were leaving uh, Rich Passage that uh, all the people lined up on the beach and all the boats waiting. And, uh, and that, it went smooth. It went well. Like we, like I say, we had enough uh, CIS boats to help. Uh, and the only other thing that really sticks out in my mind that, uh, that really impressed me uh, was the flyby with the old World War II warplanes that uh, that had been re 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 uh, furbished, if you will, and uh, zipping around. I'm not sure if I don't see them up in the back of this picture here, up off the mast. But that was a kick. I wasn't expecting that. I, in all the notoriety we got, newspapers, television, radio, nothing was ever said about a flyby like that. So it was, it was quite a sight to see. And then, um, so you uh, hook up the Missouri and uh, you start getting her underway. How are the weather conditions uh, in Bremerton that day? Oh, just ideal. Uh, yeah, no problem weather-wise at all. Um, yeah. The, I don't recall at any point from Bremerton to Honolulu being disconcerted by weather conditions. I mean, it's just uh, pretty much perfect all the way. In the background of this photo, you can see all those pleasure craft, all those sailboats just surrounding you folks, <laughs> you know, as you're, as you're getting her underway. Yeah. And then. Yeah, got, there it is. What do you, you can't beat that weather. Yeah. Very beautiful weather. Nice shot too. So, um, 
you weren't alone on this transit, Matt. It wasn't just you and your crew of eight. Uh, you had a couple passengers aboard, uh, yeah. one of them being Roy, uh, who, would, who would ride with you uh, on the Sea Victory for the Bremerton to Astoria leg. But he also had another gentleman named Bob Warnett. If you could uh, talk about Bob and Roy being aboard for the initial part of the tow. Yeah, yeah, Mr. Bob Warnett. Uh, well, both of them, the first, the first time I met both gentlemen, <laughs> Bob was looking at me with the... <laughs> I don't know. He was he was trying to size me up for some reason or another. It, I'm not sure what it was, but it it didn't take long to uh, get acquainted really really well with him, and uh, we became very good friends because we we not only did the Missouri tow right away after we went and did the tow of the New Jersey too, uh, so we spent an awful lot of time together. So Bob's uh, so Roy Bob's. Uh function was to serve as kind of a, a, a public relations liaison through the duration of the tow, correct? Yes, that's correct. We, we uh, installed a satellite phone so he could call in daily reports to the to the headquarters and the media uh, to give an update on what's going on out there at sea. And uh, Roy, do you mind telling us about your experience being on the Sea Victory for the initial leg? It was one of my dreams to to ride the tugboat and 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 get the Bremer get her out of Bremerton, but I could only ride her to uh, uh, Astoria uh, because of the preparations for her arrival in Honolulu uh, a couple weeks later, and uh, I uh, was so doggone excited and there was so much going on, uh, I was supposed to. Uh, I, I guess stand watch with Corey, and I fell asleep for 24 hours. I was I was so fatigued with all of the things that went into get just getting her out of Bremerton. So uh, I was missing in action for uh, 24 hours, and I apologize, Corey. <laughs> yeah. So you, you could have wrote him, have confine him to quarters, or uh, have a captain's mask to. Discipline him for missing his watch, huh? Yeah, the assistant is supposed to be the gopher. You got to go th three three landings down to get the coffee. <laughs> so, um, so the transit from Bremerton to Astoria was smooth sailing for the most part. Yeah, very very much, uh, no problems at all. Uh, we checked into the vessel traffic system, the Coast Guard vessel traffic system, and we had no traffic to deal with or nothing. It was just smooth sailing all the way okay so i guess uh what i want to talk about next is, is the bar and, uh -huh. uh, and pulling into astoria uh, could you please tell us about the bar and um how a challenge it is uh, how much of a challenge it is and how the transit went for the missouri yeah sure we uh interesting place we timed our arrival and the transit uh to do it on a flood tide so basically, if we blew our engines, we'd still go in one way or the other. Uh, that's a rough, rough explanation. That's a good uh, contingency plan to have. Yeah, I have, I have some pictures. I, I was telling Jacqueline or I uh, on the email yesterday or the day before that I could send pictures, and it would show the Coast Guard uh, bar. Uh, the boats the Coast Guard use that are capable of rolling completely over and coming upright. We had them uh, escorting us uh, both in and out. They were standing by, but I think they were more sightseers than anything. And uh, But it shows a, a pretty good picture. Even on a good day, there is a swell coming over the bar. The bar, the bottom of the bar is all pure sand. So you don't really worry about snagging a tow wire on anything, a rock or anything, and anchoring you when you don't want to. Uh, so you you get a nice shiny tow wire by the time you're across. But yeah, it it, it went well. Uh, a little bit of traffic once we crossed the bar and got into the main channel to approach Astoria. We we, uh, we had to make way for outbound traffic, ship traffic, and uh, that got interesting. But other than that, it, it was uh, it's very smooth. I we got lucky with the weather. The same as when we left, uh, we had 
I'm not quite sure. I think we had a, a slight ebb as we left. Uh, in other words, the the opposite. If you lost your engine, you'd still get washed out. So, yeah, yeah, everything went well. Well, good. And I understand on your way in, you got a call uh, regarding gunfire um, that you would be hearing. Yeah, I I didn't get the call, but I think uh, maybe was right? Roy, Roy was notified of that. You know, they, it was pretty hectic when I was going in, and the main thing I had to listen to was for the pilots on the on the Missouri on the ship and uh, and stuff. So I I wasn't free to listen to a lot of other banter or whatever, if you will. I had to make sure I didn't miss anything they wanted to do. So, right. but yeah, I I guess. Uh, it came to pass that somebody shot a salute for us. No, what happened uh, is uh, we got a call over the radio uh, on, on Channel 16, and it says, Sea Victory, Sea Victory, this is the United States Coast Guard. Please be aware there'll be gunfire upon you. And I looked at Corey and I said, because Fort Stevens is a um, national park, I guess, and they had some guns that they were getting ready to, uh, to fire blanks at us. And I looked at Corey and I says, should we return fire with our 16 inch guns? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we had a good laugh over that as we got over the bar and started heading towards Astoria. And uh, it, it was a nervous thing for us uh, because when Don Hess and I inspected Astoria, we also went to visit the Coast Guard to, to check on their vessels that turn over and upright themselves at the same time. And we went, oh my gosh, <laughs> I sure hope it's going to be nice, uh, nice weather and, 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 and good seas for us to come over the bar. And I, I, I knew enough about the uh, ocean going uh, uh, travels over the Columbia River bar. It's just absolutely treacherous. And and uh, it was absolutely flat that day. And as we as we got over uh, the bar, Corey looked at me and he says, uh, "You got to watch. I got to go uh, and relieve myself." <laughs> and I and I said, "What?" And he, and he turned around when he came back and he says, "Roy, if it's going to be like this, you can ride with me anytime." <laughs> <laughs> So overall, a good transit, and you pulled into Astoria uh, with relative ease, I guess it sounds like. Oh, with the, well, with the exception, as you, uh, I know that, emphasize this, but the, the Navy um, uh, required us to set up a dual alarm, flooding alarm system on the ship, which it had, but it wasn't working properly. And so with the help of uh, Don and Joy Hess and, and uh, uh, Bob Sanchez, they were able to get the uh, dual alarm system working. But as we were coming in on the Columbia River, um, the captain and I <laughs> looked at the ship and, and uh, admired it. And, we just kind of looked at each other and says, you see what I see? I said, yeah, I see what you see. <laughs> the alarm, uh, the flooding alarm went off as we were entering the Columbia River. And, and uh, he says, how long have you seen it? He says, about 10 minutes. And, and so that was kind of exciting ride up to the, uh, the pier. And I jumped off the tug as soon as I could to make sure I could get on the ship right away to make and inspect the flooding alarm system to make sure it wasn't a false alarm. It was a real alarm. And, and, and there, there was water that was taken aboard. And uh, this is what I, I thought happened. And, and, and that is during, during the, uh, uh, the dry docking period, you, you normally take the sea chest openings and plug it, uh, plug it up while they sandblast the bottom so you don't get sand in there. Uh, so, but what happened is uh, I was assured that those sea chest openings are welded shut uh, while she, uh, because she was going to stay in, in uh, mothballs. 
apparently it wasn't. And Sand had somehow got in and, and uh, we weren't able to, they weren't able, not we, but they weren't able in the, in the shipyard, they shut that, uh, the sea chest valve completely off. So water was leaking into one of the tanks and we were able to get, get the water taken out before too long but you know without any power they had to go one deck at a time into a 55 gallon drum and then up and up and then over but they got it done okay so overall herring but uh not a very serious uh flooding uh any flooding is serious on board uh, on any seacoin vessel so i i i was <laughs> very disturbed by it but you know, Don Hess and crew were able to they get it taken care of along with our uh, marine surveyor, uh, John Milbar. Well, good. So you, you, so you pull into Astoria. How was your reception and um, how was the fanfare uh, that you received while in Astoria? Well, first of all, uh, we stayed there a week. And the, the reason for going into Astoria was to kill off the alien species on the bottom. Uh, just looking at it from the dock, the bottom looked like it turned completely white. But in in being there for a, a week, we attracted people from all over Oregon there, uh, that were even bust up high school kids that bust up from Eugene, uh, quite a few miles away. I, if I'm, my memory is co uh, correct, there were about 50,000 visitors in Astoria and it perked up that whole town there. <laughs> Uh, donations, we had a one foot uh, cube uh, clear plastic donation box that uh, we were able to borrow from the port and collected over $30,000 in donations. People just dropping money in the boxes. They were able to get on the main deck only and, and take a look at the, uh, for the last time in the continent, uh, take a look at the vessel. And uh, how many visitors you estimate came with uh, to visit the ship within that week? Well, like I said, I think there were about 50,000. There were traffic jams on the highway, uh, both coming uh, uh, from Portland and, and coming up from the south. And then you had a one, one specific VIP who got a police escort in to visit the Missouri. Would you want to talk about that for a little uh, briefly? Oh. General Shalish Kashvili, the recently retired uh, uh, <laughs> chairman of the Joint Chiefs, wanted to visit. He had retired in Portland. He called and he said, I wanted to visit. So we said, well, you know, you won't be able to come directly in from Portland. So we routed him uh, across to, to Washington to come across the Astoria Bridge. And uh, he... Uh, <laughs> He arrived uh, with his entourage with his family on, on the pier and we gave him a, a private tour of the vessel. So he was very happy. Good. So, so overall the time in Astoria was positive and uh, well received by locals and uh, you folks? The, the, very positive. The, they welcomed us. We, we woke up that town with all the visitors and the money that they brought at the same time. Okay, but uh, that was short-lived. Um, obviously, uh, the ship had to continue on and uh, go on to her final destination. Um, so you did not ride, Roy, you did not ride the Sea Victory from Astoria to Pearl Harbor, correct? That's correct. Did not. I had to uh, get back and prepare for the, the events uh, that were being planned uh, at uh, Magic Island. Okay. Um, so, and then pretty much the, the majority of the Missouri staff all flew home um, with the exception of Bob who stayed on the Sea Victory, correct? That's correct. Okay. Um, so, so I'll go back to, to Corey. So uh, you, you got the Missouri again underway um, from Astoria to uh, across the Pacific. It's, it's a big jump there. Um, how did you feel uh, for the next leg? Well, uh, once again, the weather, is, uh, you couldn't ask for better weather, so there was no stress. Uh, once we cleared the bar and reconfigured our tow gear for deep sea, and that was it. Just sit back and enjoy the ride. We, we no sooner got the tow strung out and the crew started rigging their trolling gear looking for my and whatever else was stupid enough to grab the hook. Uh, 
So, <laughs> yeah, that's one of the reasons why the guys really like the Hawaii trips. They get to fish. Uh, yeah, it was a pleasant ride. We went, once again, our normal way to go from the coast out to Hawaii is we go straight south to get a better ride from the northwesterly swells and until we get to a latitude where the swells kind of quit until they start up with the easterly trade wind. And we turn, make our turn over to the islands there and everything went just, uh, you know, perfect. I, I, I couldn't, uh, couldn't ask for a better trip. Uh, halfway over or partway over, that's when Bob Warnett mentioned the Molokai, the Kalapapa, uh, thing and uh, we had an ETA uh, that the miles to go and so forth that we didn't really have to strain our engines that we were just loafing along if you will and uh, preserving the the engines and so we had so much extra time that you know sure we we got plenty of time to do to do that and we started started adjusting the, the route for that and uh, and that's when all these other things came up about uh, Hawaii flags and uh, that we didn't have a board. We had every flag we needed to cover every country we was going to go to on that trip. And we had our company flag, the Crowley flag, but no Hawaii flag. So we had to, somebody arrange for that. And uh, I think uh, Roy can tell the story better how it got delivered to us. That we finally got our Hawaii flag up and, and hoisted and so everything was good. We made our, our swing by Kalapapa and close enough that we could uh, not tangle up our gear on the bottom, but we could see vehicles and people on the on the point out there. And so that went well. We did it right in the evening just before darkness. So it was good. And then we just loafed our way across the channel and, and killed some more time to make our ETA a diamond head. Um, so Roy, uh, let's um so if you don't mind, could you please tell us about the Kalau Papa pass and review, its significance, and then the challenge with getting a Hawaiian flag to the sea victory and how you solve that? <laughs> well, first of all, we I wanted to go around to uh, Molokai around Kalapapa because I wanted to recreate the the historic great white uh, fleet sail around the islands. And so going around uh, the north side of, uh, of Molokai to pass in review uh, uh, off of Kalapapa was in order. It also avoided any uh, interfering traffic. We went between the islands of uh, of, of Maui and the Big Island and, and Lanai. Uh, and uh, so I, I thought I had arranged to have a Hawaiian flag uh, put on the Sea Victory. So in the process of reminding uh, Bob Wernett and, and uh, the captain to make sure that they flew the Hawaiian flag at half mast on the tug, uh, we gave him a call and, and Corey came back and says, Roy, we don't have that flag. It's on the ship. <laughs> Missouri is a, it came over as a dead ship. So there was the problem. Well, fortunately, I had um, a waterproof uh, canister. That, so I had the, our group of people go out and get a Hawaiian flag and put it in that canister. We got a floater with a long tagline on it. And, I, and fortunately we found out that Senator Inouye was sending a helicopter up to take pictures of her as she uh, went past Kalapapa. And I says, well, look, why don't we uh, ha ask if they would drop this canister with floater and, and see if Corey could hook, uh, you know, grab it, uh, and snag it and then fly the flag. And, uh, Corey to uh, confirmed that yes, he did snag it and they were able to fly that flag. So th that's the background story to flying the flag um, off of uh, Kalapapa. And uh, they have a picture of the Missouri now uh, shown uh, off of Kalapapa. Uh, some, somewhere in the library, I think, over there, the state of Hawaii. I gave a picture to the state of Hawaii.
Are you still there? Yeah, sorry. Um, so, yeah. so during the transit, uh, Corey, you were interviewed by NPR. Um, and we actually have that clip right now that we were going to play uh, yeah. about, the, about the transit. One of the biggest and most important battleships in American history is making its last voyage. The USS Missouri is headed for Hawaii, where it will become a permanent memorial in Pearl Harbor. It was on the deck of the Missouri on September 2nd, 1945, that General Douglas MacArthur accepted Japan's unconditional surrender, marking the official end of the Second World War. Mighty Mo left Bremerton, Washington at the end of May, crewless and powerless. She's being towed by a seagoing tug named Sea Victory and is already more than halfway to Hawaii. The warship is 40 times the weight of the tug and is connected with a giant chain, each link of which weighs 100 pounds. The captain of Sea Victory is Corey Oko. <laughs> Towing this boat on a chain that is half a mile long? What's been the most difficult part of this? Why did you take it over the Columbia River bar? I think we're having some technical difficulties with the interview, so we will share it with all of you um, after this presentation via email. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, so anyway, um, so moving on, a lot of PR was leading up to the Missouri's arrival. And um, so Roy, could you tell us a little bit about the activities that were planned and uh, for her arrival? And of course, obviously there would be a big celebration on Magic Island. Yeah, um, we wanted to to show off the ship right away to to any interested party. So we had asked uh, Crowley to uh, and and with their agreement to tow, tow the ship uh, back and forth uh, from Diamond Head to uh, Pearl Harbor or Eva Beach, what, whichever was most convenient, so that people were. Uh, right away, because if we towed her right into Pearl Harbor, she would be out of sight, out of mind, and nobody would be able to see it because of the security within the shipyard. So in, in the meantime, uh, the, both the governor and the mayor decided, well, this is a good time to, to have some celebration on, on Magic Island. So they they had a party for the ship. <laughs> and uh, I, I forget that there were tens of thousands of people that attended that uh, through the early evening and there were fireworks and everything going off for her and uh, with a, a great reception. So that was uh, one of the things that uh, I guess put the, put the tag on, this is something new to Hawaii and it'll be a great, uh, great thing to have. Uh, bringing, uh, bringing all this effort over the years uh, to some sort of closure that yes, it is here. And we were looking at some of the uh, archival newspapers that Tom Manuel had. And uh, basically there's a week full of like front page coverage with all these different interest stories about the Missouri and 
what it means to the local community and former crew members. So um, a lot of public relations uh, went behind it uh, to kind of herald the ship's arrival. Um, now, Corey, uh, you had a specific uh, time stamp that you needed to get to off of Diamond Head. Could you talk about that and the plan to have the Missouri kind of, um, you know, displayed off of the south shore of Oahu upon her arrival in Hawaiian waters? Sure. Yeah, we we had right from the get go uh, an ETA of noon, twelve hundred. Uh, that diamond had a beam, and so we entered that in our GPS right out of Bremerton, actually, and uh, and we stuck to that as long as it kept showing the ETA as we progressed across the the Pacific. Uh, they actually showed our actual ETA much much earlier than noon, but as long as we were early and not late. Boy, that was the thing we didn't want to get behind because then catching up is, is is rough. So we did. We bullseyed it right at noon. There it was. Diamond had a beam, and uh, we spent the rest of the day uh, making slow passes uh, back and forth in front of Waikiki. And before dark, uh, we let her drift so we could reconfigure the tow gear. Uh, the tow gear consisted of uh, a pennant. It was about a 300 foot pennant. When I say pennant, what that is, it's a piece of the tow wire that has a thimble uh, attached at both ends that we can shackle into the uh, the ship's actual uh, anchor chain, the Missouri's actual anchor chain. So we use a pennant there and then we add one shot of our own, what we call surge chain, its anchor chain. Uh, and that weighs just under 8,000 pounds. And then it's our tow wire that gets connected to the other end of that. And, and it makes uh, makes for uh, good surge gear. It's a very springy, if you will. Uh, boy, if you pull that tow wire and that chain hanging on that pennant out of the water, you, you, got, uh, you got a really hard pull. And that's what we did. We reconfigured it. We removed the pennant and we removed our surge chain. And then we were just connected directly to the ship's anchor chain. So we were ready for, be it in the morning, for an ETA at the uh, Papa Hotel, uh, PH, the Seaboy, the entrance to Pearl Harbor. We had a set ETA they wanted us there. I don't know, it might have been 7 a.m. or uh, some exact time. And once again, that good old GPS had us there right on the button. And then we slowly came into Pearl Harbor. Okay, and then um, so in that evening, you were going to jog out uh, further south and just kind of keep her out of the shipping lanes, correct? Yeah, we just idled around, just yeah, okay. and there was no uh, no shipping or nothing that that bothered us or we bothered anybody. We we had it all to ourselves. Yeah, and then and this was a, a, a Sunday, uh, June twenty first. Right. Right. Okay. And then, um, so Roy, from your perspective on Oahu, um, what were you doing on the 21st? And um, what? how was your day, basically? Well, the 21st was uh, the celebration on, on uh, Magic Island. And uh, like I said, it, 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 it was absolutely fantastic to see the turnout there and people that are so very, very interested uh, with the ship. And it's, like I said, it was a culmination of many years of, of Missouri being in the news. In fact, it was in the news so much towards the end here that I remember Joe Moore saying on the news, on his news report, that he was getting tired of reporting on Missouri. <laughs> but so that's how much coverage we got. So, uh, very, very successful. And that evening there was a fireworks display, correct? Yes. Uh, we couldn't have asked of anything more. And uh, Corey, how was that fireworks display from your point of view? Yeah, we, we could see it, definitely see it, that's for sure. Right on. Um, so the next morning was the big morning uh, when the Missouri was going to enter Pearl Harbor. Um, so 
Corey, if you could walk us through this and uh, your recollections of, uh, of bringing her in. Yeah, sure. Once again, everything went uh, went real smooth. I'm looking at the picture here, and you can actually see our tow wire without all the surge gear and, and uh, deep sea gear on. You can see the tow wire is dry from the tug to the ship. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, uh, one interesting thing was was seeing people actually waded out into the water, I guess, at chest deep or whatever, to, to get a better look at us. Uh, they briefly could see that, but had to pay a little attention. But yeah, everything went really smooth. Uh, no problem. And once again, there they are. These are people everywhere we went. Uh, amazing, just amazing. And then meanwhile, meanwhile, Roy, you and the Missouri staff were on Pier Foxtrot 5, uh, waiting for the ship's arrival. Um, what was uh, What was your perspective as she was being pulled in? Well, I was um, I, I was on the ship, and, and again, it, I, it's hard to explain the feeling that I had after all these years of, of Missouri going over all the bumps in the road to try and get her out here. It was a great sigh of relief, and, and we had scheduled an arrival ceremony. I believe at, at two in the afternoon to make sure that everything could be prepared properly. Because as you know, this was towed across the ocean and we took on a, a lot of salt uh, air and, 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 and debris. And so we had to get it cleaned up for a ceremony on the, on the surrender deck. And, and so at two o'clock, uh, we were scheduled to have uh, 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 opening ceremony, and, and we had uh, uh, former President uh, George H.W. Bush call in along with Senator Inouye uh, to, to offer their congratulatory comments. And uh, as with everything, there's always a bump in the road. And I remember that we had a hard time getting the telephone line hooked up. And so through the, uh, the work of Bob Sanchez, my son, and Don Hass, they were finally able to, to get the phone line connected so that the president, the former president could call in. And uh, it, it, it was such a rewarding sound because Carolyn Tanaka was our PR person in charge of the event. And uh, she was looked awfully worried because we couldn't get the sound through and she had set it all up. Well, the line, the telephone line got hooked up just in time because you could hear the president say very clearly, Carolyn, Carolyn, and, and yes, it's got it, it, it was working. And so the, the, the event was able to get staged properly uh, with the president. And he, he said a few uh, words of comment to us and congratulations. And then we got Senator Inouye on the line also, um, but uh, that with with everything that goes on, there's always some bump in the road that you have to be prepared for, and that was just another one of those things. Okay, right on. So, so Corey, you get the Missouri to Pier Foxtrot Five in Pearl Harbor. The tow is complete. What were what were your thoughts as you unhooked her and um, got underway? Gosh, I don't know. I just relieved that we did it without any mishap uh, to speak of. Uh, yeah, it was a good sense of relief. Uh, yeah, everything went well, even departures, Remington, arrival, Astoria, departure, Astoria, arrival, Pearl Harbor, everything. Uh, yeah, you couldn't ask for a better, a better job. And I think you shared with us that uh, your crew uh, rendered honors to the Arizona Memorial and the USS Arizona um, as you were departing, correct? Yeah, we finally, uh, we landed what we call, we landed it on the tow line. We stayed connected where we, as you can see in this picture, ahead of it. And we worked in and we tied ourselves up ahead of the ship. And it was a while until the ship got tied down with their own mooring lines and everything. And and then they draped in a lower, a, a lay, some kind of a lay around the bow of the ship that was pretty unique. But uh, we finally got disconnected. 
uh, we, as we left the whole crew, uh, you know, we'd all been dealing with the ship and had so much to do with the ship that uh, everybody was kind of attached to it. Uh, so from the cook, the engineer, everybody uh, kind of lined along the wherever they were standing on the side of starboard side of the ship. And uh, we blew our whistle as we slowly went by, hated to be leaving, but that was the last uh, we would we would ever deal with the Missouri as far as the sea victory. Mm. And then for Roy, I guess the the the, the real work started with uh, volunteers and um, the work of getting the ship uh, ready to open uh, for the public. Correct? Yeah, it it, it was a long haul, but I, I like to say thank you to Corey and, and his crew because we had talked about it uh, a little bit about uh, manning the rails uh, because ships in, in Pearl Harbor when they pass in review uh, of the uh, Arizona th they have the crew standing and manning the rails in, in, in salute <laughs> nobody saw what the tugboat crew did but they were standing <laughs> on their rails with their hard hats across their their hearts as they pass going out the uh, uh, leaving, and I was the only one that it was, I guess looking outward, <laughs> and I saw that, and I didn't have my camera with me, but very touching and very honorable. I, I loved it. Right on. So, uh, Corey, this was wouldn't wouldn't be the last Iowa class battleship you towed, and you kind of mentioned it earlier. Um, could you tell us briefly about your experiences towing the uh, USS New Jersey and the USS Iowa? Yeah, well, the, the Missouri wasn't the last one; it was the first one for me. <laughs> and New Jersey was a. What happened was after the Missouri job. Then we got another big one we had to do it was uh, an aircraft carrier, the USS Oriskany, uh, which was the carrier that sent it to John McKay flew off of the day he was shot down over Hanoi. Uh, we had to tow that carrier from uh, Mare Island. I had towed it earlier previously, a year or two previous, from Bremerton to Mare Island uh, in San Francisco Bay. And then the ship was sold uh, to a company to for salvage, to scrap it. And the company started removing things from it. They managed to cut off uh, propellers and, and they dropped them on the bottom behind the ship in Mare Island, things like that. And then they went bankrupt. So ownership of the ship reverted back to the Navy again. And, uh, the Navy, they wouldn't, uh, they wanted to just, Put the ship back in Susan Bay in the reserve fleet in Susan Bay, but the San Francisco pilots refused. They wouldn't take it uh, a dead ship like that with an overhang and aircraft carrier up through the Martinez Railroad Bridge to get to Susan Bay. So the Navy then said, "Well, we'll, we'll take it through the Panama Canal, and it, it's going to go to Brownsville, Texas, uh, eventually to be scrapped." Oh, the Panama Canal says, no, well, you can't take a dead ship with an overhang, which an aircraft carrier sure has, through the canal, because it would require them to remove all their light standards and things like that. So then we went to Plan C, and it was all the way around South America and up, uh, up to Texas. And that's what we did. We had five fuel stops on that, on that job, Long Beach, uh, Balboa, and the Panama Canal, uh, Chile, uh, two stops in Chile, uh, Punta Arenas, once we went through the Straits of Magellan, uh, and then Recife, Brazil, and, and on to uh, Port Arthur, Texas is where we finally tied it up. There's a reserve fleet in Port, Ar Port Arthur, Texas. It went there, and uh, subsequently after that, it got towed out of there, and they brought it over below uh, the Florida Panhandle, and they sunk it. And it was supposed to be a recreational diving site, but they overshot it, and it was too deep. It ended up you had to have mixed gas to, to dive on it there. But but anyway, that happened, uh, and as soon as that happened, uh, we went to. Uh, I got off the ship myself and uh, a couple of the other crew that was going to stay with me. 
we get off there and they let us fly home for, for a month uh, before our next job. And then the, whatever crew was left on the boat brought it around uh, back to uh, Seattle to get ready for the next job, which was the New Jersey. And then it started all over again with the New Jersey. Uh, it left, towed it to Philadelphia. And with almost the same amount of fanfare, but uh, not not quite what the Missouri was. Uh, the, going up the Delaware River with the ship, you know, there was a lot of uh, small, small craft. And every bridge we came to was packed with people looking. But it just wasn't quite the same as what, what the the turnout for the Missouri. So that was number two battleship. The number three battleship came up right after that one. We did that one in the winter. I think I left Newport, Rhode Island. They had they had uh, tied the ship up between two aircraft carriers, the Forrestal and uh, I forget what the other one was, the same Forrestal class. And anyway, I took the the Iowa out of there and it went to uh, Susan Bay. We took that all the way up and it went through the Martinez Railroad Bridge because there was no overhang. So the, we took it and tied it up in Susan Bay. And so that's three. The fourth one of that class, the Wisconsin BB-64, son of a gun, was already a museum in the in uh, Virginia, Norfolk, Virginia area, Hampton Road. So I, I didn't get to tow the fourth and last one. Well, bummer. No, three four four is a pretty good record for Iowa class toes, I think. So, <laughs> uh, but uh, Corey, uh, we're gonna we're kind of coming towards the end. Do you have any final thoughts about this toe or your career? Anything you'd like to share with our our guests? Well, uh, as I've said, I visited the ship twice since uh, since it became a museum over there, and every time I go to Hawaii, I will always make a point to go check it out and see what a great job they've been doing on it, keeping it up, keeping it in shape, because it was the better shape of all three battleships I towed. It was it had been kept kept up much better. New Jersey was close, but not quite the same. But that's it. I hope people keep coming to have a look at it and uh, donate to keep it up. Well, well thank you so much, Corey and, and Roy. Um, any final thoughts from you on your time as a president in this tow? Well, first of all, I I feel very bad that I wasn't able to spend more time with Corey and the crew. Uh, I learned more about you guys just doing this webinar. And I, I really appreciated all the work and the, and that you guys have done uh, to get the Missouri out safely. And uh, you have my fondest memories in my mind uh, about this and, and my huge uh, thanks for doing a job like this. Well, thanks, Corey. Well, you're welcome, Roy. It's been a pleasure. Well, Thank you both. Uh, we're going to go into a QA and a session uh, in just a minute, but first we're going to play a video uh, that kind of documented uh, the, uh, the transit that we kind of talked about and uh, some of the dignitaries and some thoughts about Missouri arriving in Hawaii. Um, so we're going to play that video next. I decided that this great battleship should be preserved as a national memorial. The only question is where? On May 4, 1998, Secretary of the Navy John Dalton made it official the mighty mole would be transferred to her permanent home, Pearl Harbor, away, and placed in the care of the USS Missouri Memorial Association. Flotilla escorted the gallant warship around Diamond Head and into Waikiki. Hundreds of kayaks, sailboats, windsurfers, and jet skiers, even sightseeing boats, greeted the massive ship offshore. I'm ecstatic that it's here right now. And especially when you can see it right out there, it's real. It's here in Hawaii now. As the mayor of the city and county of Honolulu, I tell you 
that I speak for every citizen on this island when I say we are honored that the Missouri has returned home. We in Hawaii have much to be proud and thankful for. That's coming up this great state. I want to express our people's heartfelt thanks to the veterans of the Great Pacific War, living and dead, who have done so much for Hawaii, our nation, and the world. So sorry, so. So now that I'm here, sacrifice the victory. Circle is now complete. Solemnly promise those who served on this great ship that she will be accorded the love and honor you bestowed upon her during her valiant service. We shall carry on the legacy, the legacy of victory and peace. God bless the mighty more. God bless America. Hey everyone, well, thank you very much. It's been my honor to moderate this discussion here. I'm gonna turn it over back to Jacqueline uh, uh, for our Q and A session. Thank you, Frank. Thank you, Roy. And thank you, Corey. We really appreciate that. Um, we do have a couple of questions in our chat room that I will pitch out to you guys now. Uh, one question is for the open ocean part of the toe, how many knots did you travel at? How fast did you guys go? Yeah, it was just under six knots. Uh, probably a, a, a Boy Scout in really good shape. If he was walking fast, he could have kept up. <laughs> doesn't seem that fast but I'm sure that it was a lot considering what you were towing yeah. um, another question which I'm not sure that we will have the answer to is how much did Cher pay to film on the ship when she did her video if I could turn back time I don't know if anyone on here knows that answer all I know is the Navy cringed when they saw <laughs> they saw what the film was We've heard that as well. I think Admiral Kihuni might know that answer. <laughs> we'll have to follow up on that one. Um, I have another question just for you both. Knowing that the ship has now been in Hawaii for 25 years and you both have had a chance to come back on board, um, what does it mean to you when you step back, foot back onto the decks of the Mighty Mo to know what an instrument you guys were in actually bringing her to Hawaii to sit bow to bow with the sunken Arizona? Corey, go ahead. Uh, for my part, I'm, I'm General Douglas MacArthur. Old soldiers just fade away. <laughs> that's a, that's what I thought about my part of it. It was John. I did, I did the, I did the job, and so be it. I, I personally am still in in awe of how and why I I I took on this project. I mean, I've spent hours in the in the captain's quarters when, when she was uh, in mothballs and just trying to feel the power and, and that what went on on this ship. I mean, I, I swear at times I could hear voices and, and I'm, I'm very proud of the fact that I was able to play a very small part in, in, in bringing her back out here, but she's a ship that now belongs here and belongs to all the people that were associated with it. And I'm proud that I played my part. I thank you both for that. And one more question, I don't see too many more in the chat room is, um, Corey, for you, on your way back after successfully delivering the battleship to Pier Fox Trot 5, did you tow anything back on your return trip? No, we uh, we ran light, uh, light meaning we had no tow. Uh, yeah, there was nothing going back with us, so we we scurried back pretty quick. Probably I think we had to to get ready for the next the next job anyway. Yeah, it sounds like you had quite a, a busy career following that tag in it of itself. 
Um, well, I think that's all the time that we have for today. We wanted to thank all of you for joining us again. This program is free for our members. If you are not a member and are interested in joining, you'll have access to this event as well as others um, in the future at no cost. Um, if you want to stay in touch with us, we are on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. I will be sending out an email with links to this recorded presentation along with the audio file for the NPR interview and that last video you heard so that you can see it in person and from the comfort of your own home. And lastly, wanted to give a shout out to the Old Salt Coffee Company, who is a sponsor of this program um, and has been for several years. With every purchase of their Battleship Blend Coffee, they donate some proceeds to the Battleship Missouri, as well as the Battleship New Jersey. So thank you all again for attending today. We look forward to having you at our next Mojo event and have a wonderful day.